Welcome to Mobile Week and our directors for the portion of Mobile Week. Uh, Daniel Chen has put together a wonderful week focusing on mobile and uh, its uh, relation to news, which is rich and interesting. And we have two really cool mobile consultants with us today. I'm going to introduce them both and then they'll speak separately and then we'll have time for Q&A. Um, Amy Guerin, who has been here, some of you met her last year. She's a uh, well, many people concentrate on the smartest of smartphones, Amy is the queen of crappy cell phones. Which, of course, the average Joe around the world is much likelier to own, and Jane around the world. And um, managing editor of Oakland Local. Uh, senior editor. Senior editor of Oakland Local. Uh, okay. Columnist mobile technology. CNN. <laughs> and general all-around uh, mobile consultant as is Jason DePonte, who is here with us, having concluded several years as the manager of the BBC mobile platform. He's really created that at the BBC, which has done an extraordinary job um, of reaching uh, into that arena and being innovative. And you blog, and you do all kinds of interesting things at the intersection of technology, news, and you'll tell us more about those. Uh, Jason is this year's first fellow, and I know many of you all have been able to see these two in classes and to do other things related to Mobile Week. So I'll turn it over to which of you, whichever is my first. And great to have you with us. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'm not going to stand around the podium too much, but I do have to get it to click. So um, thank you very much for being here, and uh, Geneva, thanks for having me for the introduction. Um, those are my contact details. They'll be up at the end again uh, if you want to tweet at me, et cetera. Um, this is the Twitter handle. If anyone has any questions that they don't want to ask or any comments that they want to make, if you want to generally be right in public, that's how you can do it without shouting during the meeting. And uh, we're asking everyone to use the USC mobile tag um, for any of the tweets or anything that's going on around this stuff this week about uh, myself, Amy, or uh, Will Sullivan is going to be here as well. So um, why mobile? Why now? Um, I like to start out with this um, slide. I've been using it since 2007, so the stat is a little bit old, but I still think it's valuable. Um, <clears throat> in a survey in the UK, about 70% of young people, those under 25, said they would rather lose their passport, their wallet, or their pets than lose their mobile phones. <laughs> That's how important these things and how integrated these things have become in people's lives. So while it's not necessarily the easiest medium uh, to work with, and a lot of people have a lot of questions about how to do that, it shows you the potential for creating really powerful content and really powerful media services if you get it right. Um, just to show you a little bit about the growth, um, these this is some projections for this year. 2011 was projected to be the year when um, smartphone and tablet sales, this, cal this column, would outstrip the sale of uh, PCs and laptops. It's already happened. It happened in February, so it happened probably sooner than some of the analysts predicted. And you can see the way the trend is set to go. Uh, there's lots of other stats in this space as well about how quickly we're going. Um, there's <coughs> also more mobile handsets on the planet than there are people now, and in the next couple of years there will be more active mobile handsets than there are people on the planet. So on average, people will start to have one point, you know, whatever phone creeping up towards two eventually. I think in Italy, um, the statistic is that <coughs> uh, most people have more than one phone now. So news is a big part of the space. That's really great for you guys, aspiring journalists and working journalists, etc. cetera. Um, news was one of the first things that was out there in the mobile world with the very early services like Palm Pilot and Avanco, et cetera, when they weren't even connected, but you could take the content with you. The downside um, for all of us, though, is that it's not one of the big growth areas in the space. So while there's big appetite for it, there's also a lot of competition from other types of activities that are moving into the space. And I think it's really important for uh, news organizations to remember that just pumping out the same old services isn't always going to work. You need to keep innovating, you need to keep smart, you need to keep pace with what your audience is doing, where your audience is going, and make sure that you're getting the news in front of them. Ooh. And um, I wanted to get this quote in um, early on in the presentation, I'll come back to it at the end, but I thought it was really interesting. It struck me um, when I was reading about Mobile World Congress, which is the big mobile industry event of the year, every year where all the new toys get unveiled and all the CEOs come out and 
write about their companies. And Eric Schmidt from Google, who are now saying that everything is mobile first, he was there doing a big keynote. And he said, if you look at the problems like global warming, terrorism, and the need for financial transparency, they can all be helped by computing power. These are fundamentally information problems, and that's what computer science is all about. And I thought, had I been able to say, talk to him, I would have said, um, Eric, wait, no, no, no. I learned from journalism school that that's what journalism is all about. <laughs> um, and so there's this interesting thing going on where we've got computers and journalists doing very, very similar things. And <clears throat> it's not to say that I think we're going to be replaced by robots anytime soon, so don't worry. Um, but I think it's really important and for us to think about our relationship with all of this computing that's going on and what is the role of journalists and what is to interact with these services and interact with the data that's coming out of this in order to do our jobs and to do those jobs more effectively. And I'll come on to more of that at the end, but I wanted to set that up now. So my definition of mobile is any interaction with an audience member on a portable device or in a mobile situation. So it's not explicitly about a specific piece of hardware or a specific type of service or a specific platform that you use. It's about creating great content and services for people that's contextually relevant to them when they need to consume it and on the device that they need to consume it. And <clears throat> what makes it different? Well, when I first started telling people I was going to be leaving my old job at the BBC, uh, which was working on a, a big chunk of the website, to go into mobile, they were saying, so you're going to be driving a truck around with satellite dishes on top? They thought I was going to be like the, the roving editor as opposed to the mobile services editor, which is kind of interesting. Um, and, then, and then I told them what I was doing. They would say, well, why? Why are you going to like these small little devices that provide these crappy services? And, and, and the reason is this. I think uh, mobile, what makes it different from fixed desktop web um, is, and, and TV and print and everything else, is that it's more personal, social, portable, immediate and location aware than any of the other media that we can create for people, when you get it right, of course. And that, that adds up to what I would call context. So you can make the most contextually relevant content and provide that in a contextually relevant way to audiences through mobile. Now, that's a nice black and white slide with some theory on it, if you believe it. But let me show you an example. This is an application um, that was built for Wimbledon. Nothing to do with me, but it's just a great example where it used um, augmented reality technology to provide content in a way that couldn't be done before. So augmented reality, for those of you who don't know what it is, is a system whereby, excuse me, you um, open up the camera on the phone and you use it as a viewing device, and then content gets overlaid on what you're looking at in the real world. So it uses a GPS to figure out where you are, it uses the compass to figure out what direction you're pointing in. And so if I was facing those tennis courts over there, or soccer field, um, it could be telling me information about what's going on on that soccer field if that content is being created. And that's what was <coughs> going on here, is as people looked around at all the different tennis courts of Wimbledon, they could get news about what was going on on each court. They could get analysis and live stats about what was going on on each court, in addition to finding out where the taxes and the bathrooms and the food are and all the rest of it. But that's something you could never do with a PC. It's something you couldn't do with a newspaper or a television broadcast. And it's not to say all of those aren't great, but this is to show you why it's different. It's not just about making teeny tiny websites. Although teeny tiny websites can be good. Um, so what's the opportunity for news organizations? Um, there's distribution opportunities and there's news gathering opportunities. And through the course of the week, I'm going to be talking about both of those here. Um, but what I wanted to do. Um, was take you through the landscape very quickly and talk to you about some of the future trends that I see coming up. So this is how I break up the space um, into four sort of categories. There's messaging, mobile media, mobile web, and apps and widgets. Apps and widgets have had lots and lots of hype lately, so I'm going to talk about them last um, and try and get you across some of the other parts that you might not be thinking about quite as much. So. Uh, Thinking about messaging, this is an example that I wanted to bring up for you. If um, you can remove yourselves from the West Coast for a few minutes, as uh, chilly as that might be, and imagine yourselves in London when Michael Jackson died. Um, the way that that story unfolded was really interesting and really demonstrated to me the power of global messaging. Because in the UK and Western Europe, people had switched off their TVs for the night, they'd switched off their PCs, radios were off, and everyone was getting ready to go to bed. And what happened was, Beep, beep. Get a text, Michael Jackson's dead. 
what do you do? How do you verify that? Well, they went to Twitter, they went to Facebook, they talked to their friends, and then in some research that we did, we found out that they only came back to the BBC and other trusted news sources for verification as a third or fourth port of call. That story was told and broken by people using various different forms of messaging to tell it to each other. They were using the rules of social media instead of the rules of traditional media. And while we were in that ecosystem and provided the trusted source, we weren't there first. We weren't breaking the story. So it really um, shows the power there and, and brings up some interesting questions, I think, about what the role is for media organizations. Um, moving on to mobile web. Um, Andy's going to talk a lot about this, too. But this slide has some really good stats that <coughs> I think if you look at, you'll see it's not all about apps. There's a lot of consumption going on, both through apps, but even more so through the browser. And a lot of people um, who I talk to, a lot of organizations say, we need an app strategy, we need an app, we need an app. And I say, well, what about mobile web? There's a lot of consumption going on there. Don't forget about it. And it's universally available on any internet-enabled, uh, well, just about any internet-enabled device. And it can be consumed by people who don't want to buy stuff through app stores and who aren't locked into certain types of devices and software, et cetera. So um, <clears throat> thinking about the future potential there, I want to show you this guy who um, is connecting from India, I would imagine. And there's estimates that there's going to be 2 billion more people connecting to the internet globally over mobile devices in the next, I think it's two years. And mobile devices at that point are going to start to become the main way onto the internet. Our way, you know, from America and Western Europe of connecting through these types of fancy computers with wired connections very, very fast. That's not going to be the norm. Of course, it will be for us. But if you want to have a global conversation about the news, you need to be thinking about the fact that how people are going to access digital news and digital content is really going to change. Um, at the BBC, the World Service, while I was there, launched 18 different uh, language services specifically for sub-Saharan Africa to engage in a conversation with people there because we saw so much traffic coming from that part of the world by mobile devices. So prediction um, for me is that the web is going to strike back if it needs to in the next year or two. I think more and more mobile web stuff is going to become important. More mobile web apps are going to become important. And you're going to see that with the emergence of HTML5 and some of the other technologies that are coming out. On the mobile media side of things, um, prediction in that space, because this is all about rich media, um, is around multi-screen interactions becoming more important and multi-screen systems becoming more important. So if you've ever tweeted while you were watching TV about what was there to engage with the community, if you used ABC's My Generation iPad app that gave you multiple video streams at the same time that you could control to deepen the impact of the program, that's what all of this stuff is about. But I think we're going to see more of that, and we're going to see people who want to do media transfer a lot more. So I'm watching on this device. I want to switch it to this device. And then I want to see it on my TV with the family and move them back and forth. This allows for new types of interactions and consumption. This allows for people to have communal viewing experiences <coughs> and personal viewing experiences at the same time. And that's really, really powerful. Um, on the apps and widget side of things, um, in this space, we've seen utility and play starting to really come together. And the classic example here is Foursquare. Foursquare is about what's going on in the city around you, where to go, what to do. It's much like the old city newspaper, you know, city listings newspapers were. Um, but they've turned it around and made it a game. And that means that you're actually doing the content, you as, not as journalists, but as consumers, are doing the content creation and the content updates and the geotagging for them. And so I think anyone who's working in the app space needs to be thinking about how to fun and play interact in this space. And if you look at the numbers of what's at the top of the app stores in any of any given day of the week, almost everything in there is going to be a game or have some element of fun and play in it. So don't forget that. Don't create just the same types of new services and whack them into an app, because that's what the new services on the web are good for. Try something different. Be more innovative. Push it out and really engage people. So coming back to this quote, and I'm going to have to <coughs> speed through this. I, I just want to show you a, a few things that um, I also think are coming up that affect how we interact there. So cell phones connecting everything. Who knows what a cell phone is? 
were you in one of the other classes? Yeah. <laughs> so subcomponent, this is an analyst term that's just come out recently, but I think it's a really good one. It talks about all the things that have connected wireless technology in them that are not telephones. They're not used for making phone calls. They're not used for sending text messages. So these are things like Kindles. These are things like the sensors that you can put in your running shoes that connect to your iPod that change the media experience that you're having. This is all very nascent, but it's important because there's actually more things on the internet now communicating that are non-human. So these are various different forms of sensors in the world all around us, cameras all in the world all around us that are creating information and creating data that we can use to make better services and provide better content with. But we're not completely engaged with it yet. And so I want to show you something quickly. Um, you're probably thinking, why is he showing this an IBM ad in the middle of this? This is not a sponsored talk, don't worry. Um, but their campaign about better cities and connected cities really struck me because when I was preparing for this, I looked at this and I thought, well, if you talk to any metro editor, any city editor at a newspaper, um, these are probably the types of things they would tell you that they cover. These are the same subject areas. But IBM are taking a very technological <coughs> approach um, to dealing with these things. And I wanted to show you a minute or two of the video about it. Forgive me if you've seen this before. <laughs> Like every city in the country has crime, fires break out, natural disasters occur, it even has the occasional fender bender. And, like every other city on the planet, the resources to address these incidents are limited. The problem was everywhere because the data was everywhere. Valuable data is trapped at the site, inefficient landscape key systems can be difficult for So, those are all news stories and all those subject areas happening, creating automatic data in and around the city. Why not just put more offices or more ships? Or buy a bunch of new ambulances and fire trucks? Again, like every city on the planet, a smarter city can't spend its way to a safer city. How can it <coughs> Welcome to the Smarter City Integrated Incident Response Center. Like the multi agency command hubs in New York City, Chicago, and Madrid, the response center helps the smarter cities first responders coordinate their efforts. So um, I'm not going to show you all of that, and the point wasn't to show you an ad, but it was to show you how much data is being created and the fact that I think, as journalists, we need to be thinking about our relationship with that data. There has got to be some amazing stories hidden in there if we can find ways of connecting with it, both automatically and in a traditional reporting sense. And also, there's a lot to think about in terms of privacy issues, et cetera. So what if you're this guy, and that's your face, and you go into one of these automatic systems? You know, journalists and the media, the reason we have a free media is to help keep government in check and to help question and be cynical about the information that the government is both using and giving to us and filtering that. But who's, who's keeping this in check? Who's keeping that computer command control system that they're talking about in check? Who's being cynical and questioning that data and the value of that and the decisions that that's making? I don't know if anyone's doing that yet, and I think that we need to think about that both in a traditional reporting sense, but also in terms of how do we connect with that data and do stuff with it, create better services for citizens with it. Um, and then, I'm, I'm almost done, Amy. Um, I'm predicting a battle over location and context coming up. Layer and Foursquare are two front runners that are taking very different approaches to this than what we've seen from Google and Facebook and how they're dealing with that. But we're seeing, and that, that creates a layer uh, location context for our users and we can give them better content, better news based on where they are. But we're also starting to see checking into TV, checking into music, etc. And how can we take advantage of this live attention data that people are constantly creating and giving to us as news and media organizations to give them stuff that's more contextually relevant? What else will people be, will be either <coughs> explicitly or implicitly telling us or checking into each time they use one of these devices and how do we harness the power of that. You create a tremendous amount of data, whether you know it or not, every time you use one of these about your movements, about the movements of the people around you, about what you're near to, what you're far from. Um, there's all sorts of other types of sensing that's going to come into mobile systems in the very near future. And I think no one's really thinking about that yet. And I think we need to take it seriously and think about it and try and experiment and see what we can do in that space. Because in the end, I think everything's going to start to be filtered by location. And this is a contact lens that's being developed at the University of Washington. And what it does is wirelessly receive data and overlay it into your field of vision based on where you are 
and what's going on around you. So if you want to think about a new way of consuming the news, think about when the news ticker just comes by when there's breaking news in your field of vision. Think about when you can see video on certain surfaces where it's contextually relevant. It's not happening tomorrow, guys, but I think it will happen. It's going to happen on, there's wearable glasses that have this type of stuff right now. And it's a shift to what um, some of the academic world are calling unconscious computing or subconscious computing. And I think that's a massive shift for what we have to do as editors and reporters and media people if we're going to be thinking about how we stay relevant and how we serve audiences with news and information in the future. So thank you very much for listening to me. Sorry, I went over to you. Uh, I look forward to the first question at the end. Over to Amy. Oh, yeah. Expensive walled garden, 
And but which, by the way, Apple is taking 30% of the subscription revenues for. That doesn't sound like a savior of the news business to me, but <laughs> Rupert Murdoch thought this was worth $30 million. <clears throat> Meanwhile, in the rest of the universe, <laughs> this is the mobile news experience that the vast majority of people have. I took that photo this morning looking up the mobile version of the LA Times site. By the way, to get to the mobile version of the LA Times site, I could not just enter latimes.com because that got me an, an, a read error on this phone. I had to remember to enter m.latimes.com just to get this. That's it. That's what the LA Times wow. thinks 73% of their mobile market is worth. That makes 73% of the mobile market look like this. There are a lot of people in the news business seem to think that uh, people who have feature phones aren't interested in news. First of all, there's a problem with how most web analytics tools record feature phone traffic. Most of them simply don't. Google Analytics records almost none of it. It just shows up as regular web hits. Uh, most other um, advanced web analytics systems, including Omniture, do a haphazard job of picking it up. So they have a, a, an artificially low view of how much, how many attempts, attempted visits to their sites they get from feature phones. And also, most of those probably show up as bounces because remember that LA Times? Mm. Yeah. When you bounce off of that, I was. I did, as a matter of fact. Now, let's talk about Oakland. After 15 years in gorgeous, sunny Boulder, Colorado, I moved to Oakland, which, you know, a lot of people have heard a lot of awful things about Oakland, but it's actually a really cool place. And a lot of Oakland looks like this. Some of Oakland even looks like this. What you probably heard about on the news of Oakland looks like this. This is also a very important uh, part of the population that probably needs news and information, especially local news and information, more than the people who live in houses like this. And they also, what we've discovered with Oakland Local, really want it. We're strictly local site, and a year and a half out of the gate, we're getting that about 90,000 unique visitors a month, almost all that local traffic. And we know from talking to people in the community, our, our brand awareness is pretty high, especially among people who live in parts of town, like East Oakland, West Oakland, uh, North Oakland, just near the Berkeley border, you know, a lot of places that don't have too much money. Here's some economic facts about Oakland. Right now, 409,000 population. The median household income in Oakland is just shy of $50,000, and that's about 3% um, below the U.S. average. The cost of living in Oakland is about 20%, 25% higher than the U.S. average. And the percent of Oaklanders living in poverty right this minute is 17.5%. Ethnicity, you know, does, does not equal income, so I wanted to separate out these issues. Right now, according to the 2005-2009 uh, data from the American Community Survey from the Census Bureau, Oakland is about 37.5% white. It's about tw nearly 29% people who identify as black or African American. Hispanic or Latino, which can comprise a variety of, of races, that's why this totals more than 100%. That's almost 25%. Asian American is 15.5%. Now, uh, like I said, at Oakland Local, we wanted to do, um, you know, do mobile development, and we came across a fabulous partner. There's an organization in San Francisco called the Renaissance Journalism Center, and they have a grant program called the Media Greenhouse Grant, where they're trying to fund uh, local and ethnic media projects. So we went to them with a plan to do some research and development to figure out the best way to make Oakland Local go mobile, and they gave us a grant. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, they're fabulous people to work with. And we, this project was two parts. The first part was me and a bunch of uh, interns from Oakland Local went out and did in the field surveys around town, different parts of Oakland, all the major neighborhoods of Oakland, and talked to people. And this is a pretty detailed survey. It probably made them do more work than we, need, than we needed to. But we got a lot of detailed information from how uh, about 84 people around Oakland who have cell phones use their cell phones. And we were, it, it wasn't a, a strictly scientific sample, sample. We just like said, walk around and talk to people who are using cell phones. So, so take that for what you will, but all different parts of town. Among that, we found that uh, out of the 84, 44 of them, so just over half, 
earned $25,000 a year or less. 14 of them uh, were uh, between $25,000 and $49,000. So that is a total of 58% that's at the median income or below. And there's a smaller number that have higher levels of income. Here's what we found. We, we're right in line with the national average. In Oakland, 70% of the phones from the people we talked to were feature phones. 30% were smartphones. And again, what, let me define smartphone here. Smartphone is a phone that has an operating system that supports both a fully featured browser and will run what's called native applications, yeah, which most people think of as apps. App, those native applications are actually little programs that run on the operating system the same way Microsoft Word runs on Windows on your computer. So, um, the most popular carrier, hands down, among the people we surveyed in Oakland was Metro PCS. It is a discount carrier. Why is that? Metro PCS has billboards all over town that says $40 a month for everything on your cell phone, not 40 ish, $40 a month. You better believe that matters to people in Oakland. 37% paid less than $50 a month from their, for their cell phone. Nearly 40% pay $51 to $80 per month for their phones. And the average um, you know, smartphone bill for an individual contract, national average, is approximately $95. But m most of what I've seen in the Bay Area is ranging from uh, $95 up to about $120 a month. My Jordan credit will cost me $120 a month on Verizon. 83% who are at the median income and below are using feature phones. This says to us, if we want Oakland Local to be inclusive to the entire community of Oakland, on the devices they already have, we need to play well on feature phones. Some other things I found. But this is just looking at the percentage of people who are at you know, $50,000 and below in income. Everybody text messages. Nobody said they never do it. This amazed me. This floored me. 83% of these people use the phone's web browser daily or on most days. Okay, think about that. Remember I told you what a painful experience it is to use the web on this? Regardless of that, the vast majority of people who have feature phones in Oakland are going on the web from their phones daily or most days. And half of them use mobile social media, and half of them use email daily or most days. Those are all vital channels to support whatever a news or information or community or you know, organization or platform is trying to do. Now, again, remember, ethnicity does not equal income. And the problem with looking over the research in this field is that a lot of the research seems to conflate ethnicity and income. You know, it, you've got to be careful. And when you look at the numbers, you don't just assume that not white equals poor. That is definitely not true. But that in mind, in May 2010, the Pew Internet and American Life Project did a really great report that I recommend you check out called Mobile Access 2010. It's available on their website. And uh, they looked at a number of, of demographic issues related to the digital divide overall. And a lot of that came down to mostly, mostly ethnicity issues and somewhat to income issues. But uh, here's some uh, information they had about ethnicity and mobile access. Latinos, now in this case, they only actually interviewed English-speaking Latinos, which is a weakness of the study. But among English-speaking Latinos in their sample of over 2,600 people that they talked to, 80% of them used text messaging. White people were the lowest number on there. They were, I think, just above 60% or so. Again, by race, if you look at mobile um, uh, internet access, that's using a web browser, they showed a lower portion. They, they showed, I think it was about 48%, and the, but the highest proportion there, again, was among English-speaking Latinos. Uh, and African Americans uh, were, uh, I think, around like 38%, and the average for overall was about like 27%. I'm telling you these things because if you are dealing with communities that are both low income and have a higher per proportion of, of minorities, ethnic minorities in it, 
yes, you need to do uh, mobile that will work on people's feature phones. These are definitely proven popular channels for that overlap of characteristics. And email also. It, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, among the, Latino, the English speaking Latino population, uh, they are doing more on their feature phones than anybody. So if you're doing market research in your area, make sure you talk to people in the English speaking Latino community. And if you've got Spanish speaking people on your staff, even better. Talk to them. These people know what they're doing. So the bottom line is I'm trying to say take the blinders off and you know, think harder about devices like these. Buy one. They are cheap. That's why people have them. Go down to Boost Mobile, Metro PCS, Virgin Mobile. You know, pay you know anywhere between about thirty to fifty dollars to get a device that's simple, and then you'll pay about forty dollars a month for access to it. And you and it, the nice thing is, it's month for month. None of this two-year contract crap. This is what, another reason why people do it. Get it, play with it, use it. And I challenge you, carry that around and make it your only phone for the week. And so yeah, you you know what? It's tough. If you're serious about media, you got to do this. You've got to know how this stuff works. You can't just play with the nice shiny toys. You've got to play with the things that people actually use. And then, open your arms up to the whole world of mobile. And people say, hello, we're glad you're here. But right now, if you're not doing anything as friendly for future folks, they think you don't care. And that's a problem. I talk to people in community groups in Oakland all the time. They assume that the news organizations in that town have not cared about them except to report on crime and fires and collapsing buildings for a long time. This is a huge problem. We're trying to be more inclusive. We're, part of how we're trying to do it is not just with our coverage, but with the devices that we're reaching out to. And we'll see how we do, but right now it's working out. That's my presentation. All right, so questions for Amy and or Jason. Or comments for letting me? You're stretching or are you? Oh, I'm actually going to have a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first uh, <clears throat> quote that you shared with us about the uh, defining certain problems as information problems, uh, global warming and financial transparency, I can see our information problems. How is terrorism an information problem? Well, understanding what the causes are, what the social roots of it are, understanding what to do if there's a terrorist attack. Uh, investigating the aftermath. It's also risk assessment, which is a very highly okay. mathematical word. And, and there's a lot of that uh, organizations uh, um, are better to use the internet to organize and <coughs> otherwise. So getting that data to in your committees is critical. I do have a question. So I found an interesting presentation which, uh, on, on use in mobile phones in Africa, and of course, again, it's just a feature front. One of the things that people can be doing on the mobile web portion was to actually access radio stations and use their, and I wonder if you've seen that to be true at all in your research. No, not so much because in, in, in Oakland, I was just looking at Oakland. There are plenty of ways to get radio in Oakland. It's easier than trying to do it on the future phone. Um, and, uh, but one thing I do see is that an awful lot of people in Oakland um, use um, mobile devices to time shift. Not necessarily phones, but a lot of times people do, you know, capture podcasts and then listen to them while they're ru running around. I thought I was the only geek who did that, but no, but it's actually pretty cool. Yeah. So in order to make, like, hypothetically, a website that would play well on a future phone, would it have to be, would a company have to create two different versions of their site, like one for iPhone and one for, like, you know? Okay, I, I have some experience in this recently. So here, here's the thing. It's, uh, there's a reason why news organizations have avoided this, because even though it looks like you're creating something very simple, it's actually <coughs> technically a bit more difficult to create depending on the content management system that you're using. Um, now, I haven't tried to do this with any proprietary system which most major news organizations use. Um, I've just been doing it with an open local. We're a Drupal site. And, um, I've done this before with WordPress sites, and it was dead easy. It's just a matter of creating another, you know, putting another theme on it, and then putting some scripting on the server that runs it. It's called auto detection. That it looks at incoming traffic and says, hello, what device are you on? I am on a Mac. OK, you go over here. Hello, what device are you on? I'm on an iPhone. OK, you'll go over here. Hello, what are you on? I'm on a really crappy Kia Sarah. All right, we have something for you over here. Uh, that's what auto detection does. And all it does is that it outputs the, the um, content in the appropriate theme for that device. 
strips out the elements that that device won't be able to handle and vertically stacks everything else. I thought this would be easy. With Drupal, it is not because in WordPress, themes are basically just cascading style sheets. That's fairly simple to, to um, implement. Drupal themes are actually more like extensions, more like little programs. They're a combination of PHP and CSS. Also, everything in Drupal is very modular. I mean, it is to a certain extent in WordPress, but way more so. Drupal is really just this Legos conglomeration. And it's because of the way themes work in Drupal, it means it's more likely to create procedural conflicts with other modules in the site. So we launched our mobile site, our mobile theme, and it worked, it worked. And then I checked it a couple of weeks later doing some core functionality tests and it was broken. And so our developer worked on it, he got it fixed and it worked and it worked and then it was broken again. So I mean, would yeah. it be feasible to create a program that one could market to new sites and say, here, if you like plug this in, it will tell people, you know, it'll convert your website to yeah. that? Yes. But again, it depends on the content management system that people are using. The problem is Drupal sites can be configured so many different ways. But this is why so many Drupal sites still have very blocky themes. Okay, that, that, that's the reason for it. For something like WordPress, it already happens. If you go into the WordPress theme <coughs> library, tons and tons of mobile themes and you know, little bits of JavaScript that you put on to do the auto detection, and it works like a charm. I've done it, and I'm not even really that geeky. But uh, but for uh, Drupal, it's a problem. From what I've been learning about Expression Engine, I think that may also present a problem. Uh, it definitely presents a problem with Joomla, although not that Joomla is not really used for these sorts of, of programs, uh, these sorts of applications that much. Um, it would be nice if there was a sim there are third-party services like MoFuse that will basically just take feeds from your site and then reformat it and put it out there, but the problem is it may or may not be under your domain and you definitely won't be able to, to uh, track the traffic as effectively. It's one way to do it and it does work, but just keep in mind you're basically creating a separate fork for your site there. I think um, picking up on that point as well, um, one of the things that I would say you should absolutely do is make sure you structure the site in the way that Amy is describing, such that the same URL always resolves to the same article. Because if you have a mobile site over here with one set of URLs and a website over a desktop website over here with a different set of URLs, your search information is going to go crazy, and people will end up entering one URL and getting the wrong version. You know, if you get the mobile version on your PC, it's going to look like a mess, and you're going to think, "What in God's name is going on?" So, one URL that resolves to the right version of things, depending on what device you're on, is really absolutely my advice. Yeah, because if you create two separate sites, you're basically forking your database for your content management system. That has a whole lot of other really nasty potential implications. You know, people can't share the links around. Yeah. So, did everybody get that? <laughs> <laughs> other questions? Or? Yes. I have a question about news being split up into. Um, the news being delivered on the web as well as uh, news being delivered in the apps was a much more richer experience, but you have to pay for it. So how would that um, happen? I mean, how, how would that come out, play out in the uh, in the public? Well, you don't necessarily have to pay for it. I mean, there's lots of free apps and free mobile websites that are mm -hmm. Also, so well, we Google Modoc is coming out with an app just for the tablets, right? Yeah, the, uh, the, the daily. That's what I put right. up there, and that's that's one potential um, way to do it. By the way, I think it's a huge mistake. But you know, I mean, what you know, and I, I would question the assumption that the experience in apps is necessarily richer. Mm -hmm. If you work hard on mobile web stuff, you can do some very rich stuff. When I was at the BBC, and I, I can't take credit for the actual execution of this, but the tech guys had the foresight to build our multimedia catch-up service, which was full TV and radio programs for seven days. And they built that as a mobile web application. So it looked like an app, but it was still all on the web, and it used web technologies. And it's really easy to repurpose amongst different sites. So um, and I think with the new stuff that's coming out, like especially HTML5, the way that rich media can be handled and streamed and everything is going to be that much better. So I think you will be able to create rich experiences using mobile web. Yeah. I think the thing that I always say to people is use the web for what the web is good at and use hardcore executable software for what software is good for. Like Amy was saying, you know, don't try to create Word on the web and don't try and create a website using an app. It's, you know, use the right tool at the right time and you'll get the best audience engagement. And, and also, it's important to consider the development issues. So if you're going the native app route, you're trying to do your iPhone app and your Android app and your BlackBerry app, those are three different pieces of software you have to pay developers to develop. 
and implement. Now there are some tools that will make that easier, but it requires, in my experience, a lot of customization to really make it fly, and they all have to be maintained and updated. Whereas if you deploy um, something for the mobile web, it will play in the web browsers. There's also a key, pers a key point um, called responsive design that, that smart web developers know how to do, and that is designing the website so that based on the type of, it detects the type of device it's displaying on, and will scale back and take out items, you know, according to, you know, dis you know s squeeze down to fit into the device. You can do that all the way from something like, you know, a full computer screen or an iPad down to a feature phone if you have really well done responsive design. Which is why any project that you're working on to hire a developer for, if it's an online project, make sure you are only hiring developers who have existing demonstrable mobile web development experience for your content management system. This is not something that comes intuitively to most web developers. You need to hire people right now who have mobile web experience. because. We have a great developer. He does a fabulous job with the site, but all these mobile issues, he was learning it, teaching himself as he went, he was doing a great job, but he kept tripping over things. And uh, you can if, find somebody who's done it before. Yeah. I, I think you made a <coughs> really good point about the features in, in feature phones, because it's really easy to kind of get into this Apple iPhone bubble that everybody has their smartphones. I know from uh, back home in Finland, the, um, Nokia is a big brand there. Uh, two thirds of all the Nokia phones have a built in FM radio in it. Mm -hmm. So when they are doing uh, research on traditional radio, the fastest <coughs> segment of devices where people, what people use to listen to radio is the cell phone. Mm. And it doesn't require any data plans, it works everywhere. You don't need any. Yeah, because you can get an FM receiver on the same end. Yeah, and yeah. what people do, they actually listen to the FM broadcast and, and uh, browse at the same time so because people are sitting in public transport, not in cars. Right. So it's really kind of, you know, have to get away from the mindset that, you know, iPhone is the thing that everybody uses. Yeah, it is. I mean, go to the U.S. Census Bureau, the American Community Survey, and, you know, whatever city you look in, check out the economic data for within, say, five, a five-mile radius of, of the zip code that you happen to be in. You will see a lot of variety. And when you see that variety, you're going to see a variety of mobile devices. Well, we wait for the next question. Tell us what, why do you feel the daily is such a less idea? Um, okay. Rupert Murdoch hired a staff of about 100 people to create uh, a rich media experience that's still general media, okay? It's, it's supposed to be a you know, general interest, like magazine-style publication, uh, which is, has been proven to be the most difficult kind of content to monetize on the web. And they're selling it to release it just on a single device that, yeah, it gets a lot of hype, but, you know, with, with how many iPads are there out there? Uh, it's it's on the spot, sorry. Definitely, definitely nowhere, nowhere near as many as this. But Although fast growing. Yeah, but anyway. I mean, if you have, if, if you say, if you have. But they're not on, it's not on all tablets, it's exclusive to iPads. It's exclusive yeah. to Which is one of the weird things about iPads. It's, it's, ex it's exclusive to the iPad, plus um, Apple, from their subscription program, takes a 30% cut of all subscriptions. Now, if you, you've been in the media business for a long time, subscriptions is a tight margin business. And in fact, subscriptions have never powered the vast majority of, of uh, media publications. It's always been advertising. Subscriptions has always been a tiny percent, I think it's like 10 to 15 percent of overall revenues for any publication. So you factor all those things in together, and you factor in that Apple has demonstrated over and over that they are willing to change the rules of business at the drop of a hat. The same week that, they, that uh, Rupert Murdoch was holding his press conference about the daily, Apple announced that they were rejecting from the App Store Sony's e-reader. Why? Because their e-reader app, if you wanted to buy new books from the Sony bookstore, it jumped you out of the app and into the browser so you would make the purchase outside the browser because Apple was you know, claiming 10% of revenues from everything done within the app. And Apple said, you know what? We don't like it that people do that anymore. What do you know? They released a policy that if you're selling anything from an app, you, you have to also be able to sell it for the same price elsewhere. So it, the, the price in the app can't be lower. This is a friggin' lousy business deal. Why do you think you did it? He does a lot of dumb things. <laughs> you know, I can tell you, for, for a good friend who's been running Interactive for a for many, many years, and he's had the same issue of saying, 
we need to be pushing in the direction of using HTML5, and how do we create more flexible, deliverable across more platforms. And he said he got, you know, been a senior person at one time and didn't know that they came down with a big heavy hand and said, we're only doing an iPad app here, we're not going to develop an iPad app. You know, it's interesting. And, and it's, it, it feels like the old model. It, it appeals to their psychology. First of all, it's pretty. It's gorgeous. Okay, I'll give them that. It's very nicely designed. And it, it creates the appearance of a walled garden where you have to, people have to pay to get in. That's what so many people in the media business are like, can't we go back to those golden days? It's traditional. Like that was ever the case. It, I think it appeals to all their vanities and weaknesses. Question. Becca, uh, students Sorry. come up with some questions while Becca asks it. Okay, <laughs> yeah. go ahead and then you. Uh, yeah, just a quick question for Jason. Have you talked to IBM about their ideas? I mean, uh, every newsroom would love to have that tool in there. No, I mean, to be honest, it's an idea that I kind of struck me while I was preparing to come here, and I thought, let me try it out with you guys and see, see what you think, see if you buy it. Did people, did people buy that? I mean, one of the classes I talked to said that they found it overwhelmingly creepy and scary, and I read, I read 1984 um, when I was far too young to be reading that type of book, and it's haunted me and creeped me out ever since. So I mean, what do people think? Is that quite an optimistic view of the future or quite a scary view of the future? And what do you, what do you think we should do in that type of a connected up world? Well, so we've got a hand over here. Good. Oh, um, well, I think that it's just kind of scary because I feel like the whole world of marketing and advertising is everyone's just like, oh, how do we break out of the noise? And I feel like the more connected we are, like the more it builds up, it builds up, and it's just like this rat race that goes into infinity. So, you know, the more connected things are, and the more you, know, you check in or you do all these things, like, where is there to go from there? Even? That's I think one of the more scary. The Sparta City Initiatives, as far as I understand it, it's about uh, coordinating and, and integrating municipal data for, yeah. for municipal systems. This is something that is absolutely essential because cities cannot function if they don't know what's going on. Believe me, I live in that. Yeah, but I mean, the promise, you know, the promise of that from IBM is that the computers will do all of it for you. And my thing is, <coughs> wait a minute, shouldn't. As the media, what's our role in well, that? And what's the role of the government in okay, that? The relationship, does it start to change? Counter example, that's how the power grid functions. People can't make those decisions in real time. Now, people can intervene in decisions, but for some kinds of systems, like traffic signals, you don't want people making decisions in real time how we're going to adjust the red lights down below. No, but where's the, you know, where's the oversight? Where are the checks and balances? Yeah. And that's, you know, as these decisions become more automatic and become more data driven, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. I think as journalists and editors, we need to be thinking about how do we What's keep those role? checks there? And how do we also take that data and do different things with it, potentially, than you know, to see are there other stories hidden within that data when you cross-reference it and when you do stuff with it? But I mean, that, that's massive computing power that you're talking about to do that. Um, I was actually wondering, going off that idea about like, in my head, it sounded like the journalist is now like the watchdog of like the data that's being automatically computed. I think it might be. Um, and I'm wondering if, I mean, do you think that now we are just gonna have to expand, like, you know, now we're gonna have like a whole of people who aren't there, like watching the data and trying to like, you know, get this and then tell the journal. Like, how how is the the system gonna change? I don't know. I mean, that's an open question. But what I do know is that you know, journalists long done research on big heavy duty data sets and a lot of the times, you know, even before I was working, <laughs> I involved spreading out, you know, spreadsheets that you've got in your hands on all across all sorts of tables and having interns and reporters <laughs> sifting and piling through government reports looking for the data points that connect up and make a story. But I think as the amount of data around us increases and increases and increases, um, we need to find systems that will do that. And we have the opportunity to create consumer applications that are doing that checking and doing that interrogation in real time and creating content out of it in real time instead of sort of subpoenaing documents or freedom of information acting documents which are then two years old by the time you get them and then do the analysis on them and then turn them into a story which gets lawyered which then has right of reply and all of this stuff it's you know that the process like everything else is speeding up really quickly i think there is a really interesting opportunity for data though data makes great apps whether they're native apps or web apps and in fact if you go to apps.usa.gov um, you'll see a lot of, uh, of apps that have been put together based on databases from the u.s federal government labor statistics health information all sorts of stuff the vast majority of apps in that collection are web apps they run in any web browser 
And um, this is something that uh, news organizations and journalists can think about. It's not just about creating, say, the New York Times website, but maybe a bunch of separate applications produced by people at a news organization to create something to fulfill a certain function so that people can interact with the information. And then you can also layer stories around that to give them something they can do. These, these things are all about what can I do. People don't want to just sit there and read on. I think it's interesting that the art world is starting, not all of it obviously, but there's parts of the art world that are starting to go to this place. So there's a game in London that some uh, artists have launched called Chromarama, which uses our metro cards to track where people are going in and out. And it's a game, but it also creates heat maps of what's happening on the underground in real time. So where are people getting stuck? What's happening? Which stations have the most, you know? And there's a, an artist who I know named Lynette Woolworth who's using <coughs> underwater sensing data about the temperature of coral reefs to help people understand what's happening there. And she's creating artworks out of it at the same time. So, you know, these are things that are there to be tapped into. And, you know, they're creating sort of artistic, beautiful, creative things, but I think there's lots of other more journalistic <coughs> stuff. Not, not to say one's better than the other, but I think there's a lot of journalistic stuff that can be created out of this as well, in the widest sense of journalism. Sounds like a good stopping point. Thank you so Thanks. much. Really interesting.